It is a particular pleasure to introduce this particular session because we have two great debaters, two very strong spokespersons for their positions. And you now have the privilege of listening in first to a formal presentation by the two speakers of exactly 25 minutes each, and then to a cordial discussion, which we don't expect to aim at a uh, reach agreement, but you will be able to see them push and probe each other's positions and cordial but intelligent responses. And you, skeptics or otherwise in the audience, are asked again to assess with the best of your intellect uh, with the arguments that you hear. And again, the session will culminate with your having the chance to ask your questions. But since we can tell from the long lines that your questions and comments are crucial, after this debate ends, we'll invite all the afternoon speakers, all five of them, back to the front in order to allow more of you the chance to raise a question of any of the speakers. So with no further ado, let me introduce first the positive, the affirmation. Professor, I'm sorry, Dr. Hugh Ross earned a PhD in astronomy from the University of Toronto and was a research fellow in radio astronomy at Caltech in the 1970s. In addition to publishing many technical scientific papers, he is the author of numerous popular science books that defend his faith, including among others, The Fingerprint of God, The Creator in the Cosmos, Creator in Time, Beyond the Cosmos, The Genesis Question, The Origins of Life, and Creation as Science. Dr. Ross is founding director of Reasons to Believe, an international, interdenominational, science faith think tank. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ross. Welcome. Testing creation. Unlike the intelligent design movement, we had reasons to believe do have a model. We identify the designer. It's a model that's testable, falsifiable, and predictive. And as we heard from a number of speakers this morning, design is really not the issue. Everyone agrees we see design in nature. It's the nature of the designer that's really the issue of debate. And I'd like to pose a couple of questions that might help us to identify whether or not the designer uh, is indeed the God of the Bible. Two questions. Is the scientific evidence for the existence of a divine creator shrinking or growing as we learn more and more about the record of nature? And is the evidence such that we can eliminate some or all alternate explanations? Now, several of the speakers this morning were cosmologists, and it was Fred Hoyle who made the comment that uh, cosmology is a fervent ground for this God uh, debate. Comment he made about the Bible, there's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It's a remarkable conception. And he was really coming from a, a pantheistic perspective. But he's right. The Bible has more than 10 times as much content about cosmology as any other holy book that undergirds the religions of the world. And there are three cosmological points that the Bible repeatedly describes and describes in some detail. Number one, that the universe arises from a singularity beginning, what we've been hearing about this morning, uh, beginning of matter, energy, space, and time, that the universe continuously expands from this point of beginning, and it's a universe that continually gets colder and colder as it gets older and older. Now, the important thing here is to realize that for over 2,000 years, the Bible was alone in making these statements about the universe. You didn't find these kinds of statements in any other holy books, uh, philosophy texts, or textbooks of science. It wasn't until the 20th century that we had extra biblical description of these cosmic features. Now, even though you may not uh, be a believer in God, I'm sure most of you are quite aware of at least a few of the passages in the Bible that talk about a cosmic singularity beginning. The most famous being the first sentence, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for create is to create something brand new that didn't exist before. And the words for heavens and earth refer to the entire cosmos of matter, energy, space, and time. 
Hebrews 11.3, the universe was not made out of that which was visible. It was made from that which we cannot detect. Other Bible verses declare that space and time were created when the universe began. We heard this morning references to Augustine, who developed that, uh, that theological position uh, from the pages of Scripture. Well, in the 20th century, the 21st century, we live in a day and an age when we actually have some scientific evidence that we can bring to bear whether or not this biblical statement has any validity. In particular, we have the space-time theorems of general relativity, which state that if the universe contains mass, and if general relativity reliably describes cosmic dynamics, then space and time must be created by some cause beyond matter, energy, space, and time. And today we can put this to the test in the sense that unlike what we see in the early part of the 20th century, we have about a dozen independent tests of the reliability of general relativity and the strength and number of these general relativity proofs are growing. Probably the most significant one would be these binary uh, neutron stars that are orbiting one another closely. General relativity predicts that the orbits uh, will gradually merge and we can measure that merging and today we can confirm the reliability of general relativity to reliably describe the dynamics of the universe to more than 14 places of the decimal. In the words of Roger Penrose, general relativity now ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics. And likewise, we see that the space-time theorems are becoming more numerous and more generally applicable. Uh, over the course of about 10 years, we have Arvin Borde and Alexander Valenkin exploring uh, to the degree uh, to which we can uh, put the application of the space-time theorems. And they concluded that any universe that expands on average must have a beginning in the finite past. And so we just simply assume that the universe is expanding on the average that tells us of the validity of these space-time theorems. Or in other words, all reasonable expanding universe models, models that would permit the existence of carbon-based life, are subject to the relentless grip of the space-time theorems. Now this enables us to make some predictions about what we should discover in our future scientific research if indeed this biblical concept of a transcendent uh, beginning, uh, a singularity beginning is true. We would expect that as we learn more about the record of nature, that evidence for a single cosmic beginning will get stronger. That evidence that time is finite rather than infinite would increase. In other words, that time is actually created, has a beginning. And that evidence for general relativity, reliably describing cosmic dynamics will grow. Uh, we're eagerly awaiting what's going to come from the gravity B probe and other tests of general relativity that consequently the grip of the space-time theorems will become more relentless and the case for a transcendent causal agent will gain strength. I mean, the easiest way to scientifically put the Christian faith uh, into the dustbin would be to simply prove that there's no beginning to the universe. But we're predicting that evidence for that beginning will gain strength rather than get weaker as we learn more and more. And we would argue that indeed has been the record of the past hundred years. Now the significance here is as this gets established more and more firmly, it tells us that we are faced with a miraculous act in the sense that something transcendent uh, to the science we can measure, space and time, matter and energy, has occurred, and that at least opens the possibility of the door in scientific investigation that causes we investigate may either be natural or supernatural, and we should be open to checking uh, both of those out. But the Bible actually says much more about the expansion of the universe than it does the beginning of the universe. And six different Old Testament authors, uh, using the Hebrew word nata to continuously expand, often translated in English as a stretching out of the heavens, but it was a Hebrew scholar, John Ray, who pointed out to me years ago that ancient Hebrew could not have been more explicit in describing a continuously expanding universe and actually describes this expansion as a surface effect, both in Psalms and in the book of Isaiah. Now, today we have many experimental proofs that indeed we do live in a continuously expanding universe. And thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, we can actually see this visually. Uh, the image on the left, the universe as it looked 12 billion years ago, 12 billion light years away, and the universe of 2 billion light years away. And you can see this is all the scale that the galaxies are much more 
tightly jammed together when the universe was only a little less than two billion years old as compared to the are today. And also as the universe continuously expands, we see merger events taking place which make the galaxies older. Now, the Bible also repeatedly states that we live in a universe that's governed by constant physics. One example would be Jeremiah 33, 25. God speaking, I've established the fixed laws of heaven and earth. Uh, but Genesis and uh, Romans and Revelation, other passages we can go to establish the fixity or the constancy of the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. And it's Romans 8 which gets into some detail on what we would recognize as the second law of thermodynamics. The entire creation groans, subject to its bondage to decay. Now the significant point here, if we have a universe that continuously expands under constant laws of physics that is subject to the second law of thermodynamics, this is a universe that will get uh, continuously colder and colder as it gets older and older. And if we know the age of the universe, the time back to the beginning, then we can easily calculate the rate at which it should cool down, that solid curve there. And we see the measurements that we've been able to make in distant gas clouds and quasars far away that tell us indeed the universe is cooling off as we would see described in the pages of the Bible thousands of years ago. Now in terms of what's really governing this expansion of the universe, there are two factors, the mass of the universe and dark energy. But dark energy, as we heard this morning, is the dominant factor governing cosmic expansion. Uh, we were told that it was 72% of all the stuff of the universe is dark energy. And uh, right now, as we measure the expansion rate of the universe, we can see the evidence slightly favors a closed universe, although an open universe is still a possibility. This is significant because we heard a lot about what can we do to test for these different multiverse hypotheses. And this is an example. Uh, many multiverse uh, speculations would be eliminated if indeed the universe uh, proves to be uh, slightly closed. So future measurements might be able to give us some insight onto exactly uh, what kind of an inflationary universe we indeed live in. And the cosmic expansion rate determines what kinds of stars and planets will form and what time in cosmic history they will form. And herein lies uh, spectacular evidence for fine tuning. It was Lawrence Krauss who stated back in 1998 in the Astrophysical Journal, dark energy would involve the most extreme fine tuning problem known in physics. And the point is, for physical life to possibly exist, this dark energy would have to be fine-tuned to within one part in 10 to the 122. And we can compare that with the best example of human engineering design achievements. It exceeds our best human engineering design by literally 10 to the 97 times, indicating that the causal agent behind space, time, matter, and energy must be that many times more intelligent and more knowledgeable and better funded than the Caltech and MIT physicists who designed this amazing uh, gravity wave telescope. But this isn't the only example we have of cosmic design for carbon-based life. Uh, many of the constants of physics equally show evidence for exquisite fine tuning. And you say, why carbon-based life? Well, carbon is the only element uh, within the laws of physics that we see here that permits the chemical bonds that life requires. Silicon and boron, for example, simply won't give us uh, the kinds of stable, complex molecules uh, that life, uh, physical life would demand. Now, there are many more than just these 10 cosmic design features, but this is where we can actually put belief in God to the test in this sense. Uh, if indeed uh, God uh, is the answer for all this fine tuning, we would anticipate that as astronomers learn more and more about the universe, this evidence would get stronger and stronger as we learn more and more. And at reasons to believe our scientific team uh, first started going through the scientific literature to uh, find these fine-tuned characteristics uh, back in 1990. We found 17, and we've been continuing to do that as astronomers have been making more and more discoveries. And the last time we accumulated our list, uh, there were 140 of these different fine-tuned features. And uh, you can go to our website at reasons.org to see the list of the features, their descriptions, and the citations. Now, this is evidence for fine-tuning design at the largest possible scale, but it's not just the largest scale that we see evidence for design. 
it turns out that you need not only a finely tuned universe, you need a finely tuned galaxy and a finely tuned star, a finely tuned Jupiter, and it turns out it's not just Jupiter that must be fine-tuned for advanced light to be possible on the Earth. You also need a just right Saturn, a just right Uranus, a just right Neptune. You even need a just right uh, Kuiper belt of uh, comets and asteroids. And uh, most of you are probably aware of the fine-tuning that we would require for the planet in which we live and uh, also uh, for this unusual moon that orbits about uh, planet Earth. Now, going through uh, the requirements of fine-tuning for all of these astronomical bodies uh, to make physical life possible leads to a number of tests of supernatural design. We're talking about a testable model after all. If there's no creator at all, <clears throat> then we would anticipate that as astronomers learn more and more about the universe, we would see a shrinking of these design evidences, both in terms of the number of fine-tuned characteristics and the degree of fine-tuning we see in these characteristics. And that consequently, evidence for a biblical God as a designer would get progressively weaker and weaker as we learn more and more about the universe. On the other hand, if there really is a creator, we would expect it to go the other way, that design evidences would increase in strength and number, and that evidence for a biblical God as a designer would get progressively stronger. Uh, now, we st first started doing research on this with our Reasons to Believe scientific team back in 1995. And there, going through the scientific literature, uh, we found, 30, uh, found 41 different characteristics of our galaxy and solar system that needed to be fine-tuned for advanced light to be possible on our planet, and then taking into account generously the dependency factors amongst these different features and the maximum number of planets that might exist in the universe. We use Carl Sagan's number of 10 to the 22 uh, planets and that many moons as well. And that led to a calculation that there's less than one chance in uh, 10 to the 31 for a carbon life supportable body to exist by natural means alone. But then this is what we've discovered since, again running up to 2006, that the list has grown from 41 features we could identify in the scientific literature to 676. And you can see that the probability has gotten substantially more remote uh, that uh, we could find a planet anywhere in the universe capable of supporting not advanced life, but just bacterial life. Well, a second test we can develop. If there's no creator, we would expect that these design evidences would be for life in general and not humans in particular. But if there is a creator, at least the creator God of the Bible, uh, the Bible tells us that God created the entire heavens for the specific benefit of humanity. Therefore, we'd expect to see more spectacular design evidences for humans than for life in general. And uh, what you'll see posted on our website is a comparison between what you need to find a planet or a moon that could support bacteria for 90 days or less, compared with a body that would support bacteria for three billion years. On such a body, you need recycling mechanisms uh, to keep the nutrients flowing, and you need to deal with the physics of the changing uh, luminosity of the star. And then the bottom one, what about uh, a body that could support the equivalent of human beings? Well, here you can dramatically see that the evidence indeed for fine-tuning design is much more impressive for humans than it is for bacteria that stick around for three billion years as opposed to bacteria that only can last uh, for 90 days. Another test, if there's no creator, we'd expect to see design evidences on some size scales, but not all size scales. On the other hand, if there is a creator, we would anticipate that we would see design evidences on all size scales. The universe, the galaxy cluster, the galaxy, the planetary system, star, planet, the planet's surface, uh, and uh, the planet's life. And this really bears in on a lot of the speculations concerning the multiverse. The multiverse would simply be one more adjustment in the size scale from what we've already been seeing as we move from the surface of our planet out as far as our telescopes can perceive. Uh, but again, going through the scientific literature, we see it doesn't matter what size scale we look at, we do see evidence for fine-tuning design uh, on all size scales, uh, not just, say, our planet or our solar system. 
Uh, even in the case of our moon, 27 different features must be fine-tuned in order to make advanced life possible on our moon. Now, the planet's surface and the planet life, we're anticipating that those list of characteristics will grow because this is an area where really not a lot of anthropic principle research has been achieved yet. And so we would be curious to see how that develops in the next, say, decade as we continue to put this to the test. And another test is that if there's no creator, we would anticipate that astronomers would find many systems within this vast universe of 50 billion trillion stars that would be capable of sustaining advanced life. Uh, many uh, galaxies like the Milky Way galaxy that could support advanced life, many stars like the sun, many moons like our moon, planets like Earth, etc. On the other hand, if we see the crater as described in the pages of the Bible, we would anticipate that the Milky Way galaxy, sun, moon, Earth, and Earth's planetary systems will prove uniquely capable of sustaining advanced life. Now this is an area where testing still needs to develop, but what I have here is a chart that shows you where it exists so far. We can exist, examine a few thousand galaxies closely enough to see if they're sufficiently like the Milky Way galaxy that they could support advanced life. Uh, in case of the stars, we can see millions that we can make those kinds of measurements. Uh, gas giant planets, we've only discovered uh, 306 so far, uh, but I would argue that within three years that list should be up to well over 1,000, so we can make this test uh, in a more definitive fashion at that time. We only have 169 moons we can see. They're all in our solar system. But the number of, of twins of these kinds of bodies that would enable advanced life to exist on our Earth in each case is measuring to be zero. Now, in view of the shortness of the time, I can only give you these few uh, scientific tests to evaluate our model. There are many more that you'll find in our books that we've written on the subject, over a dozen books. Uh, but today we've heard a lot about the god of the gaps, and I anticipate this might be a re reaction you might have to this. And in terms of the god of the gaps, you need to appreciate that gaps exist on both sides of the debate, and always will. We're never going to know everything there is to know about the universe. So there will always be uh, anomalies and problems that we need to solve, and the progress of a test of a good model is every time you solve an anomaly or problem, does it uncover other anomalies and problems, and are those anomalies and problems at a lower level of difficulty than the one you've actually solved? But as I said, gaps go both sides. We have the naturalism of the gaps. Do naturalistic explanatory gaps get bigger or smaller, more or less problematic as scientists learn more and more about the record of nature? And in spite of what you heard this morning, I would argue that for the origin of life from a naturalistic perspective, the gaps have gotten dramatically bigger uh, over the past 50 years. And likewise, you can make a case uh, for the Earth uh, as a design body and uh, the origin of humanity. In the last 10 years, there's been a revolution in uh, human origins, indicating that now the predominant model for explaining human origins is what you see described in the scientific literature as a Garden of Eden hypothesis, because how closely the new DNA data and the evidence for cultural revolutions and the dates that we're getting uh, for the origin of humanity match what the Bible is saying. Uh, not that everybody's adopting the biblical model, but they are recognizing the consonance between the evidence and what the Bible teaches. Now, in this respect, I think Victor and I are at least to some respect on the same page. And I got a quote here I'm going to pull from uh, Victor's paper, Is the Universe Fine-Tuned for Us? And it's a quote that I agree with. I do not dispute that life as we know it, Victor says, would not exist if any one of the several constants of physics were slightly different. Additionally, I cannot prove that some other form of life is feasible with a different set of constants. But anyone who insists that our form of life is the only one conceivable is making a claim based on no evidence and no theory. And I totally concur with Victor's assessment. We would both agree it takes someone much smarter and more powerful than us to design and build a realm, heaven maybe, where alternate forms of intelligent life like angels uh, could thrive. Where we do differ is on the capitalization of the someone. I'm sure you'd want a small s and not a big s. And in my remaining uh, three minutes here, I want to say a little bit about the history of life, since that's been a, much of the subject matter of today. And you know, there's some new tests, uh, brand new tests, 
that we can develop to test whether or not the history of life is naturalistic or some kind of supernatural creation. Uh, we've already heard this quote from Stephen Jay Gould. Evolution is fundamentally unpredictable. If the tape of life were replayed from some point in the distant past, the outcome would be far different than the one we see today. Uh, but for 20 years, Simon Conway Morris has been debating Stephen Gould about this explanation of the history of life. He says, repeated evolutionary outcomes for species in different habitats and survival stresses occur hundreds of times, and that there must be some hidden natural laws that explain these repetitions. Uh, one example he gives is the chameleon, the sand lance, how the tongue structure and the eye structure is identical, even though from an evolutionary perspective, these creatures are not related. In his books, uh, he literally gives over 100 examples of a morphological repeated outcomes. And my colleague, our staff biochemist, Fazal Rana, in his book, The Cells Design, gives over 100 at the biochemical level. But recently, there was a test published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, literally just weeks ago, uh, this paper here on historical contingency that describes a 20-year-long experiment with 12 populations of E. coli bacteria run for 44,000 generations, which basically proved that Stephen Gould was right and Conway Morris was wrong, that strictly natural means will not produce repeated evolutionary outcomes. Only one of the 12 populations evolved, and going back more than a few thousand generations, the researchers could not get the evolution to repeat. Therefore, something beyond natural means must be responsible for the hundreds of observed examples of repeated evolutionary outcomes. Now, well, this is experiment designed to bring out natural process if it would exist. I mean, the experiment, you can read the paper, it was ideally designed to bring out and test what the natural processes are. Now, from a biblical perspective, this makes sense. God's seventh day of rest explains why present day experiments only reveal strictly natural outcomes. After God created Adam and Eve, he went into a state of rest from his work of creation. And if you want to read about this, uh, you can look at a literal definition, the Hebrew word for day, yom, as a long period of time, a reference frame of Earth's surface, as the, and then the scientific accuracy of the events that we see recorded in Genesis 1 and confirmed in Psalm 104 and Job 38 and 39. The Bible gets a perfect score with respect to the scientific evidence of four for four initial conditions and 10 for 10 on the creation events. Now, I know that a favorite subject for Victor is the problem of evil, and I tackle that issue in a book that was released uh, just two weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Russ. Let me immediately introduce Dr. Victor Stinger. Dr. Stinger is Emeritus Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Hawaii, as you've already seen from the photo, and Adjunct Professor of Philosophy at the University of Colorado. His research career helped establish the properties of strange particles, quarks, gluons, and neutrinos, and helped pioneer the emerging fields of very high energy gamma ray and neutrino astronomy. He is the author of a number of popular science books, including Has Science Found God? The Comprehensible Cosmos, Timeless Reality, The Unconscious Quantum, Not by Design, and of course, the New York Times bestseller's most recent book, God, The Failed Hypotheses. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sting. computer set up here. Hugh, I'm really looking forward to reading the peer-reviewed uh, paper that comes out of your work. Uh, <laughs> then I'll be able to really you know, check some of those, those numbers that you have there. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is, is kind of supplement 
what uh, some people said today. I want to concentrate again on, on the origin of the universe and some of the origin questions. And uh, also, I'll, I actually uh, uh, will have a response to some of the things in the previous speaker. So I'm going to ask, was the universe created? And we're going to look at it more, more from a theological uh, science, uh, plus science point of view than pure science. I want to start with the fundamental question about where do the laws of physics come from? Because even, even though uh, Lenny Susskind gave an absolutely beautiful talk which, uh, uh, about the laws of physics, which gave us the annex, a possible explanation for the fine-tuning problem, uh, the theists could still come back and say, well, yeah, but where did the laws come from? And so that's still going to be an issue. And uh, of course, they say they came from God. And uh, let's see if we can think of an alternative possibility. Now, that alternative that I would like to propose is that the laws of physics, in fact, were not handed down from above. I think it's, it's our religious type thinking, Moses and the Ten Commandments, that leads us to think that the, the universe itself is governed by a set of laws uh, handed down by God, or if most scientists would say, well, there must be something fundamental about the nature of the universe that gives us these laws. But basically, I'm arguing, and I would like to argue as an alternative, that the laws of physics are not restrictions at all on the behavior of matter. The laws of physics are human inventions, and what they are is, are restrictions on the way physicists may formulate their mathematical statements about observations. And physics models, if they're going to uh, describe an objective reality, have to possess a property which I will call point of view invariance. And this is a generalization of, of the work of uh, Emmy uh, Noether, who back in 1915 proved a very important theorem. And that is for every continuous symmetry of the laws of physics, there exists a conservation law and vice versa. So the most important laws of physics, conservation of energy, linear momentum, and angular momentum, can be said to follow from point of view invariance. Uh, she basically showed that any, uh, any, any physicist who was, this is reformulating, she didn't put it in these words, I'm putting it in, in my words, that if you are a physicist and you are going to uh, write uh, down a, a model based on space and time, and you want to make sure that that model does not depend on any particular position, or, uh, let's say, position in space, moment in time, or direction in space, then that model will automatically have to contain these conservation principles. They're there. They're, they're, there's no avoiding them if you're going to uh, have a model that has space-time uh, symmetry, rotation and translation symmetry. In fact, if you extend the, the principle to four dimensions, and you allow rotational symmetry, you ask what's the co consequence of rotational symmetry or, or rotational invariance in four dimensions, you get the uh, Lorentz transformation, which means that special relativity just follows, again, from this principle of point of view invariance. So pretty much all of classical mechanics is right there, in, in, uh, because the, the laws of uh, Newtonian mechanics follow from linear momentum conservation and, and so on. And so the idea is that gauge symmetry, which has been the, the principle behind uh, the development of physics in the 20th century, uh, up into, you know, right through to the standard model, uh, is a generalization of Noether's theorem to, from space and time to uh, the space in which you uh, draw your uh, state vectors, as in quantum mechanics, that if you ask for point of view invariance, that's the same thing as gauge invariance, unitarity. A lot of these terms have the, uh, mean the same thing. And so uh, you can find that uh, just about all the laws of physics, not every one, but uh, uh, quantum mechanics, for example, uh, uh, pretty much follows from, from this principle. So there's a conjecture that I'm making here, and that is that uh, the laws of physics are, are just what they are because they have to be that way if the universe in fact, came from nothing. If it came from a, a situation of absolute symmetry, then those are the laws 
that should exist and there was no need for a creator to produce those laws. Now that's the controversial, I'm starting out with this because it's the most controversial thing I will say. You can argue about it, but it is, I, I maintain the possibility. And even if you don't want to accept the gauge symmetry argument, and incidentally, I didn't mention that gauge symmetry has been known for 50 years. Local gauge symmetry gives you Maxwell's equations. You can derive them. For, uh, and uh, charge conservation follows from global gauge symmetry. So a lot of good reasons to believe that gauge, that the uh, Noether principle can be generalized to that situation. And I think a lot more work uh, could be done on this to, to see how far it can go. Now, there's another argument uh, that is common among theists, and, and I was uh, uh, surprised to, uh, to, to hear uh, uh, Dr. Ross talk about it. This is an argument that's been going around uh, for 30 years. Actually, it's based on an ancient argument uh, from Aristotle. And, and Aquinas, uh, and William Lane Craig is, is a, a Christian apologist who, who uh, has uh, cast this principle in terms of uh, an argument he calls the Kalam cosmological argument, make it sound like it has something to do with Islam. Uh, but here it is, the argument is that everything that begins has a cause, and basically uh, uh, Hugh gave, uh, gave this, this argument today, and not in quite uh, these words, but this is, he said the same thing today. Everything that begins has a cause. The universe had a beginning, namely the Big Bang. Therefore, the universe had a cause. That's the Kalam cosmological argument. Now, there's a related argument that goes along with this, a related claim. It's, it's based on the theorem of Hawking and Penrose back in 1979, that the universe began as a singularity. And you mentioned that today, the universe began as a singularity. Well, uh, Craig and other theologians have used that argument, uh, uh, saying therefore space and time began with the Big Bang, and there couldn't have been any before if time began with the Big Bang, and so only a supernatural origin is therefore possible. Well, let me refute those arguments. First of all, not everything that begins has a cause. This is uh, uh, familiar from quantum mechanics, quantum transitions such as nuclear decays, atomic transitions that give you light uh, do not uh, have cause. They're unpredictable, at least according to the most common interpretation of quantum mechanics. Furthermore, the universe did not begin with a singularity. That, uh, uh, sing that the singularity theorem was, was tossed out long ago by both the authors, Penrose and, and Hawking. And Hawking talks about it in his 1988 bestseller, The uh, uh, brief history of time. He, he kind of jokes about it. He said, I became famous by showing that the universe uh, had it began in the singularity, and now I'm trying to convince you that it didn't, and the reason it didn't is because of quantum mechanics. The theorem wasn't wrong. The theorem was based on general relativity, but general relativity is not a quantum theory. And uh, quantum mechanics has to come in uh, at, at those very early moments. So the universe did not begin with a singularity. And therefore, the universe need not have begun or uh, uh, had a beginning or a cause. No creator was therefore needed uh, by those arguments. Now, what I would like to do is show you a natural scenario for the origin of the universe. This is based on the uh, Hartle and Hawking model that was, was uh, published in 1983. And I'm using a, a simplified uh, version of it that, that David Atkatz uh, showed back in 1994. Now I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to show some equations because I want you, to, you want to understand that this is a fully developed model. Uh, it may be a toy model because it may not be, have everything that every cosmologist would like to see, but it is a plausible model that I think closes the gap that you, uh, you can't have a uh, natural origin of the universe. Doesn't mean the universe actually began this way. As long as you can find one plausible natural explanation, you've closed that gap in the God of the Gaps argument. It, the principle is based on quantum tunneling. This is a very well-known process. You know that if a, uh, if a body uh, uh, has an energy less than the height of a, of a barrier, it can't exceed that barrier. A dog can jump a a fence in the yard unless that he has enough kinetic energy to exceed the potential energy of that fence. 
But in quantum mechanics, where particles are represented by waves, you have a, a wave in this example here. Uh, as you see, there's a wave coming in from the left. It's a sinusoidal uh, wave function that represents a physical particle. And then uh, the Schrodinger equation, which gives you that wave, actually has a solution inside of the barrier, even though the particle inside of the barrier is unphysical. It has an imaginary momentum. It's not measurable. Theists are often saying scientists shouldn't be talking about things that are not measurable. We can talk about things that are not measurable. You can solve the uh, Schrodinger equation inside the barrier, and you get the particular uh, exponential type of uh, function you have there. And you notice it leaks through, and then it becomes a physical particle on the right. Now, as I said, this is a well-established process. It's the explanation for alpha decay. That was made by George Gamow about 50 years ago. It's the basis of the scanning tunneling microscope. So this, this, I'm not speculating here when I'm talking about quantum tunneling. And quantum tunneling is nice because it gives us a real concrete way of understanding the notion of a quantum fluctuation, which is a kind of a vague idea. You can think of, a, of the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics resulting in an uncertainty in energy that enables the the particle to jump the barrier. And, and, but quantum tunneling is uh, something you can work out mathematically uh, and is a lot more satisfying, I think. So let me just show you some of the equations, how you do this. The level here is about undergraduate uh, uh, physics level. You start out with the cosmological Friedman equation, which is shown there. I'm doing this in one dimension. I'm assuming a, uh, an uh, a, uh, isotropic universe where A is the scale factor of the universe, just think of it as the radius of the universe, and then there's rho, and there's uh, the, the density rho, and Einstein's constant g, and then there's this parameter k that could be either plus one, minus one, or zero. Uh, let me define A zero squared, and let me let k equal one, which is the closed universe uh, uh, ex uh, choice. And then we assume an empty universe. In that case, rho is, is just given by the cosmological constant. So that simplifies it there. And then you can, you can solve that equation. And you get this hyperbolic cosine that A varies with time as a hyperbolic cosine. And that's, that's inflation. Now, it's not the familiar exponential inflation, but the hyperbolic cosine has, has, a, has two exponentials in it. And it gives us, uh, in, in practice the same result as exponential inflation. So there's, uh, there's the solution of the cosmological equation. That's all classical physics. But now what you can do is you can follow standard procedures in physics called quantization, which you use for going from a classical physics equation to a quantum physics equation. And you get what's called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which, which is given there where psi is called the wave function of the universe. And again, this is in one dimension. I've simplified uh, the problem by assuming a, a spherically symmetric universe. Now, it turns out that that equation is just the Schrodinger equation for a particle of mass 1 half and energy 0. I'm letting h bar c equal to 1. And that particle is moving in the potential energy that's given by that equation on the bottom. Now, if not enough equations. There, there's the potential energy, VA, as a, function, as a function of A. And there's two regions. There's a physical region outside, which is like that region outside of the barrier in the uh, problem I showed earlier. And then there's this unphysical region inside. And inside, the solution of uh, the Friedman equation uh, is, is given there. But time is imaginary. So time, uh, time is an imaginary number in the unphysical region. And so that means that's a region that we can't make measurements. That's, again, like the region under the barrier in the quantum tunneling problem discussed er uh, earlier. Now, what Harrell and Hawking, Hawking did is they produced uh, a solution. There, you know, there are a number of solutions you could write down. But there's a no-boundary solution in which there are equal amounts of incoming and outcoming waves. And these are, these are the, they look complicated, but you can fit it on a t-shirt. I mean, this is, after all, the wave function of the universe. Don't think that's complicated. That is as simple as, as you can imagine it. There's a region, again, 
uh, the, the, uh, there's the physical region at the top and then the unphysical region. And I'll give you, show you what it looks like. Uh, here it is. is uh, here's the wave function of the universe. Again, you see that oscillating part on the right, that corresponds to physical region where things, particles are real. And then you have this unphysical region, which uh, uh, is, is unmeasurable and uh, has no structure, has maximum entropy, whatever you, however you want to put it. And that's about as, as uh, good a definition of nothing as you, as you can come up with. Now, uh, usually the solution they, they draw is something like this. Paul Davies had a similar picture today where they kind of, instead of the singularity at the beginning of the universe, this is a space-time diagram. Instead of a singularity there at the bottom, they kind of round it off. Uh, but there's another, another way, another possible solution that I prefer, makes more sense to me, and that's here. Again, we have uh, uh, the shape is, 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 I think, more accurate because it's exponential. The, uh, you can think of that cone uh, as, as a series of rings, the rings of radius A as a function of time, and it, it, it exponentially inflates. But there's a region where it starts out here that is nothing, where the region where time is imaginary. Now, as I pointed out, uh, and, and uh, Sean uh, uh, also talked about that today, that uh, there's no reason why uh, you, you can't go back in time and uh, before, earlier than the, uh, the Big Bang. And so there could be another universe on the other side. You could think of that universe as tunneling into our universe. However, that universe has, a, has an, uh, ha an arrow of time that points opposite to ours because entropy is increasing in the, that direction. In our negative time direction, entropy is increasing. So an observer in that universe would not observe a contraction, would be observing, a, a, observing an inflation just like we do. So there's two mirror universes that come from the same point, uh, 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 come from nothing. So that's a, that's a worked out model. I gave you the mathematics, it's worked out. It, it, it's, it's based on, uh, now, uh, the best physics knowledge, and we could even calculate the tunneling probability using, uh, this is textbook physics, incidentally, uh, at the, uh, you know, about sophomore level. Uh, uh, and uh, you calculate the probability for, uh, I, I should say, what does the wave function mean? What does the wave function of the universe mean? I, I should have said that earlier. Basically, the wave function of the universe means that if you have an ensemble of universes, and you square this wave function, you square the amplitude of it, that's the probability per unit A that you will find a universe with that particular value of A. It's, it's just like uh, it, the meaning of a wave function of the hydrogen atom, same meaning. Now, if, if the probability of that transition is about two thirds, which means that uh, if, if you call that physical region something and the unphysical region nothing, that something is twice as unlikely, or twice as likely as nothing. And that helps answer another question, namely, why is there something rather than nothing? And let's see if I get to that here. Not yet, there's something else I wanted to say. And that is if you, uh, you, you, you look at the entropy of the universe as a function of time, and uh, I haven't shown, I'm not showing the negative side of this, this would be just a mirror of this. The, Entropy of the universe increases with time. That's the red line. And it's always, less, it's always less than the maximum entropy. The maximum entropy of the universe would be uh, uh, a universe that was a black hole. Uh, a, a black hole of the same radius at any given time would be the maximum, would give you the maximum entropy. The universe is not a black hole. But at the very beginning, at the origin, the earliest uh, measurable moment, which is the Planck time, you notice the two curves come together. So the universe started out with maximum entropy, but it doesn't violate the second law because it was also minimum entropy. It was both the maximum and the minimum. And, and, and in other words, the universe was, was complete chaos, maximum chaos, and so that's why I say the universe contains no memory of a creator. If there had been a creator, uh, there would have been no memory of it. Now that's of course subject to, to those, these pictures, the picture that the universe started out uh, a, a, in, a, in a, a region very small of Planck dimensions. If it did, this wouldn't hold, but that seems to be uh, the best uh, 
uh, with our best knowledge of the, of, of the present time. Now, that means that the only possible creator is, in fact, the creator that, that uh, Einstein abhorred, namely the god who plays dice. And, uh, and so, you know, Nancy talked about, Nancy Murphy talked about the project uh, to find uh, a place for God to act in the universe. And I, I, I've read a lot of those papers from the Vatican study on that. And uh, basically what, uh, it seems to me that what they've come up with is just this. This is the only God that's really possible. First of all, he's not a theist God, he's a deist God. Uh, most people in this country, 40% uh, of the, of the um, American people do not uh, believe in the Christian God. They will say they're Christians, but if you ask them what God they believe in, uh, what kind of God they believe in, it turns out to be a God who doesn't act in the universe, and that's the deist God. They don't know that, they wouldn't know, they wouldn't recognize the term deist, but, but that's what they really are. That's a, that's a recent survey from Baylor University. And, and the theologians who are trying to find a way to uh, uh, have God act in the universe without violating any of the laws of physics can only come up with this God, the God who, played, who started the universe out by playing dice and, and let it run its own way. And uh, 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 however, whatever happened, then as, as uh, Kenneth Miller said, it doesn't matter. Whatever, if, if, if dinosaurs uh, uh, grew with brains and, uh, and that was God's, uh, it doesn't matter, it still fulfills God's needs. So in a way, you could still say this is consistent with the idea of God, uh, uh, but it's a God who has, has nothing to do with the, with the Christian God, a God that doesn't answer, this God doesn't answer prayers and not, certainly would not be worth praying, for, praying to because he doesn't do anything. Now, the, let me get back to that issue of why is there something rather than nothing. First of all, why should, why should, uh, hmm? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay, thanks. Why should nothing be more natural than something? That's the first question. Uh, as I showed you, uh, something is, is, you know, in that model, something is actually twice as uh, likely as nothing. But there's no reason for uh, something not being a more natural state of affairs. And, and one argument you could give for that is a familiar physics argument, that symmetric systems in physics tend to spontaneously undergo phase transitions to less symmetric systems of, in the absence of energy. And we have the familiar example of water, which is uh, more random than ice. It becomes ice if you leave it alone. If there's no energy present, that will be a natural, spontaneous transition that takes place. So there's a tendency in, in physics for uh, Sim um, simplicity to produce complexity, and nothing is more symmetric than nothing. So, <laughs> Frank Wilsick gave that answer back in 1980 when they asked him, why is, he, why is there nothing rather than something? He said, nothing is unstable. <laughs> Scientific American, 1980. Now, uh, there's a question of fine tuning. I don't have time to really cover this. There could be other forms of life. We've heard about multiple universes. Those probabilities that Hugh gave, I don't know how you go about estimating probabilities. Not all constants are constant, and uh, the universe is really not all that fine-tuned for humans. Uh, again, I would like to comment on something that Kenneth Miller said. He's, he, he believes in God because there's so much order and, and out there, the universe is such an orderly place. Of course, he's a biologist. He sees order. If you're a cosmologist, you look out there and you see nothing but disorder. Most of the universe is, is entropy and, and uh, uh, very little order. There were just these tiny little pockets of order. So it's really not that fine-tuned. Besides, if God was perfect, why would he have to fine-tune the universe? Why would he have to twiddle a bunch of knobs to make the universe come out just right? He, uh, he could make it right the first time. He's God, after all. <laughs> now, uh, we talked about the Constants of nature, Here are, here's what the standard model tells you about the variation of the three constants. Notice they come together at some high energy. So, so the fine tuning of those constants uh, uh, is, is just a matter of waiting in time for the universe to cool enough so they, they could differ from one another by a sufficient amount. Uh, 
I've also uh, done my own simulations of universes by changing the constants of some of the constants of, of nature. And you can get, uh, I've changed them by 10 orders of magnitude and half of the universes come out with stars that have a billion years lifetime. So the lifetimes of stars are, uh, are, are not particularly tuned for life. And I just would end with this quotation, for God so loved the human race that he went to the expense of building 100 billion trillion stars and carefully shaped and crafted them for 14 billion years so that at this brief moment in time, we could all have a nice place to live. <laughs> now, I don't have him on this boogie board, but it's a quotation from my friend Hugh Ross. Thanks very much. <laughs>Uh, we have this uh, policy here that whenever you make a statement, you're accountable for it. And so both of the speakers are accountable first to each other and then to the 700 of you. Uh, so, but we're going to let them talk for a bit. So everyone sit down, sit down. I know everyone wants to stand up this time of the day. But we have to give them some chance to do a little informal discussion. We sit here in a living room. We're comfortable. Just like our living room at home with 700 people watching. And um, we'll just, just chat like, a little bit like about, the, about the arguments. And I think it would be most appropriate to ask Dr. Ross to begin and maybe ask you just to pick up on one or two parts of, of Vic's talk and see if you want to make a response. And then we'll let the discussion just emerge from there. Well, I like the talk. And uh, I think you did a better job than Hawking in describing his model. <laughs> I heard him give a talk on this. Um, <clears throat> But what I see you doing is showing that you can make a different universe and uh, have it mathematically consistent. And uh, I mean, have you ever considered that that's actually compatible with a Christian worldview? In a Christian worldview, God doesn't just satisfy himself with one creation with one purpose. Uh, and I appreciate the quote you gave for me at the end there. Uh, but that kind of focuses on just one purpose for God making the universe. Uh, I can count at least 11 other purposes that God has for making the universe. It really explains why the physics is the way it is. But also in Christian theology, there's this idea that God has alternate creations. You know, one for the angels, there's a new creation for redeemed humanity. You got a heaven, you got a hell. So this idea that you can make a different universe uh, that would have life in it, I mean, is, is completely compatible uh, with the Christian worldview. And I also like the way you brought up this whole idea that uh, you know, here's Hartle and Hawking bringing out this alternate model. Uh, but it's actually a Christian concept in the sense that you know, we have this universe confined in time, real time. What we see Hartle and Hawking doing is invoking imaginary time. You know, and this is something that Augustine brought up, that uh, you know, God was temporal, independent of the time that makes up the time, the cosmic time that governs our universe. So I don't see this as necessarily uh, contradicting the Christian faith, but rather something that's quite compatible. Well, I think that in general, I mean, I, I, I don't see that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, I find that uh, science is, is totally incompatible with, with, uh, with what I understand are Christian beliefs. Now, it's true that theologians can go away and come up with uh, a god like, like the deist god, and then, and then try to make that sound like the Christian God, uh, and uh, you know, pick and choose various quotations from the Bible and so on that seems to agree with that. But uh, uh, that's, it's still stretching it. How, how does that God, how to become a God that you would pray for? A God that uh, set the universe up, and it's uh, the reason why mo most people uh, are, are really closet deists, not most, 40%. Uh, why so many are really closet deists is because deism makes so much more sense than theism. If God was uh, all-powerful, then why, why would he have to step in at all uh, in the course of events? And yet that's fundamental to Christian belief that God steps in and, and answers prayers. Uh, and, and so on. And we heard some talk about prayers in the previous session. Uh, the fact is that there have been very careful studies done by, by reputable institutions, Duke University, Harvard University, uh, and uh, Mayo Clinic, 
uh, done, uh, experiments incidentally done by scientists for the most part who were believers, who would love, have loved nothing better than to show that prayer works, but they were also good, honest scientists, and they had to admit that the data were, were negative. There's never been any evidence that God does anything uh, in the universe. That would be an interesting question to discuss. Um, deism is much more reasonable than theism, that is, divine action. Well, I've read uh, Victor Stinger's paper on uh, this quantum theology, and I completely agree. I think you've done a beautiful critique of uh, deistic theology. I'm not a deist, I'm a theist. Uh, I've also read your stuff on prayer, and again, I think you've done a beautiful critique of uh, Christian mispractices of prayer. I mean, as I look at what you've got here in the book, again, I find myself agreeing that uh, you've done a beautiful job of critiquing uh, what the Bible basically says is the wrong way to pray. I mean, as, you, as I read the Bible, prayer is the most powerful tool God has given us. And because of its great power, he's put restrictions on its use. But Christians are people. I mean, they tend to abuse the tools that God gives them. And again, I, I, I really appreciate your critique that uh, this is really not the way to pray. Uh, the church that I serve in as a pastor, one of the pastors, it's just four miles from here. And our church is filled with engineers and scientists. And we actually did some of these tests on prayer. And I basically came to the same conclusions you do, that uh, this is really not the way to pray. Let's go through the Bible and see how we really should pray. And we pray according to biblical principles, will we see results? And uh, we're convinced that we did. Right. Well, first of all, since you've been saying so many nice things about me, I better say something nice about you. <laughs> if, you if, if, if you do a, uh, a Google on, on Hugh Ross, you'll find that he is not the most popular Christian among Christians, that there's even one site that's called uh, the Heresies of, of Hugh Ross. So he's, uh, he's, he's uh, uh, someone who uh, uh, stands up for what he believes in, obviously. So, uh, but I think we seem to agree on, on the prayer thing. Uh, you, you, you refer to, to the Bible uh, as, as, your, uh, as your source. Uh, I find that um, I've read the Bible, and uh, I don't see the same things you see. I mean, I, I read Genesis, for example. You say, <clears throat> and, uh, and incidentally, every every, uh, every every religion has had a a creation story, and uh, you you look at the Chinese creation story, you find it's a lot closer to what cosmologists have come up with than what the Bible has. Uh, you try to say that the Bible talks about expansion of the universe. Every, I, I, every place I read, the Bible talking about the universe refers to it as a firmament. It doesn't talk about expansion at all. And, uh, but again, you could pick it, you, I'm sure you'll find, you know a lot, lot more about it, the Bible than well, I, I mean, do. You're going to find word. examples. But, but let's start, just well, talk about he, the Genesis can, story. Can just, let him jump in to yeah. what you've said so far. Yeah, I mean, the Hebrew word for heaven's got three different literal definitions, just like the Hebrew word for day has four different literal definitions. So when you talk about the firmament, you have to say, well, which of the definitions is being invoked here? I mean, is it talking about the troposphere where the rain clouds form? Is it talking about the realm of the stars and galaxies? Or is it the third heaven that Paul referred to uh, where God dwells uh, with the angelic mm -hmm. realm? And so uh, I, don't th I think you're pulling out of context what Genesis 1 says, but to me what's different about the Bible in terms of creation accounts is the multiplicity of the accounts. You know, as I read the Quran, I find two accounts of creation. I find four in the Mormon scriptures, but uh, two of them are somewhat plagiarized from the Bible and the other two repeat it. So I look at the Bible, I find 25 chapter length or longer creation accounts written by many different authors. And the thing that appealed to me is that I was not raised in a Christian home. I didn't meet Christians that talked to them until I was 27. But when I picked up a Gideon Bible, the thing I noticed is it stood alone amongst the holy books and saying, everything must be tested. Over 25 creation accounts, you have the opportunity to test your interpretation of Genesis 1 by the other 24 accounts. So for example, I notice in your writings, you think that Genesis 1 teaches that the sun was created on day four, uh, where I read Genesis 1 and it says, let there be light. 
and let there be the great lights. It doesn't say that God created them. Now you might say that's implicit, understanding of God transforming the atmosphere, but if you go to Job 38, it's explicit. Job 38 also covers the six days of creation, as does Psalm 104, and where Genesis 1 is implicitly implying that the sun existed before the six days, uh, Job 38 is explicit. I mean, it's just an example of how we can take different theological perspectives. And you're right, there are Christians that accuse me of being a heretic, but my whole point is it's not enough to take the Bible literally. We must take it literally and consistently. Yeah, but what There's you're 66 doing... 66 books. Yeah, what you do is you're, you're basically molding, molding the, the readings to, to suit your, your, uh, your particular No, theories. I would I disagree. Mean, these... these uh, 25 different one, uh, different versions, they're probably all incompatible with one another. The only ones I'm familiar with are the first two, and they're incompatible with one another, as well as being incompatible with... Where? With, uh, doesn't the, uh, the second version uh, start with life uh, first, and then the... Uh, okay, the... you look at Genesis 1, you look at Genesis 2. What Genesis 1 does is focus on the physical creation and gives you a strict chronology of the creation events and gives you a quick summary of the spiritual creation. What you see in Genesis 2 is a reverse. It only selects a few of the physical creation items. After all, it's already stated in Genesis 1, and it's you know, sequential. What you get in uh, Genesis 2 is an abbreviated, unsequential list of the physical events, but you get a detailed, extensive, chronological list of the spiritual events. That's why you got Genesis 1 and 2 side by side, one focusing on the physical, the other focusing on the spiritual. And when you appreciate that there's sequencing of the physical events in Genesis 1, but not in Genesis 2 and the reverse of the spiritual events, then it's completely compatible. But it still has the Earth before the, before the moon, before the stars, so it's not, it, it's, it doesn't read at all like uh, uh, cosmology. I, I, don't think we, I don't want to get into a a uh, biblical discussion with you because I'm not a biblical scholar. <laughs> that may not go well. So, so, so it doesn't, it, to me, it doesn't matter. So It doesn't matter. But if the, Bible the, could have, the Bible could have been uh, very accurate and it still wouldn't convince me that, there was, that it, it re required, uh, unless it made some kind of unique prediction, some kind of prediction about the future that the people who wrote the Bible couldn't have known about. But it does do that. It does that repeatedly repeatedly predicts future scientific discoveries and future sense. historical events. Only in the Vegas sense. How about the book of Daniel? Yeah, right. Well, we now know... <laughs> <laughs> well, you made that statement in your book here. Uh, in fact, you mentioned me personally, just saying, you know, all the predictions that Hugh focuses on in Scripture are only confirmed in Scripture. Well, that certainly is not true. I mean, there's many places where the Bible makes predictions of future events, where we seek confirmation outside of the Bible. You know, one example I was going to give was Daniel's prophecy of what was going to happen in the future with the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. And now that we have found that portions of the book of Daniel show up in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that really does establish that what he wrote predated the events. Could I take I us back to a part of your talk, Dr. Stinger, and uh, he mentioned the Kalem cosmological argument and the assumption that the universe must right. also have a cause, and offered some criticisms of, mm -hmm. of that assumption. I wonder if you could address that criticism, which I found interesting in the talk. Well, it is, and uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, Bill Craig, and uh, Bill and I had an interesting debate at Cambridge University on this whole issue of the column argument and uh, space and time, physics and theology. And we do take slightly different views, so I'm not quite in the same camp as uh, Bill Craig, in the sense that um, uh, I don't see God as being lacking temporal capabilities before the creation. You know, as I read my Bible, I see God as being highly temporal uh, before he creates the universe. And so I look at the creation of time as a creation of cosmic time that's defined as a single dimension of time that's not stoppable or reversible. That does not mean that God's activities are limited to linear time that can't be stopped or reversed. And this gives you a whole different perspective on the Big Bang singularity than what you see in some of the writings of the well, other Christian theologians. Well, no, but theologians. You, you, uh, you make the same fundamental mistake that he makes, and he still makes it. I, I debated Craig in 2003 in Hawaii and tried to point out to him the, 
uh, that, that there was no singularity. A month or two later, he was speaking in Colorado, and he was still talking about the singularity. It's still on the website. He refuses to, and you apparently do too, refuse to look at Stephen Hawking's uh, uh, own uh, ref refutation uh, yeah, of the singularity, does, which and, means the universe didn't begin with the Big Bang, didn't have well, to begin with the Big Bang. No, I've read his paper, and I've read his book, A Brief History of Time, and he says, yeah, if we're talking about real time, like the universe in which we live, then there really is a singularity, but if we're willing to invoke imaginary time, then we can get around that singularity. Uh, but where is the evidence for imaginary time that's attached to this physical no, it's universe? Not, it's not, it doesn't have to be imaginary time. It's, uh, th that's a different issue. That has to do with a specific model. Well, that's the, the model you the, presented. Yeah, here. that's the model I presented, but, I, uh, but this is something more general, that quantum mechanics, uh, first of all, the earliest, first of all, time is what you measure on a clock. And the earliest, the, the smallest measurable time is the Planck time, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So all you can do is go back Planck time by Planck, step by step in units of the Planck time to the earliest possible moment, and that's the Planck time. It's not zero. And at the Planck time, there was no singularity. The singularity only occurs at time t equals zero. But you never reach t equals zero because the whole assumption is that time is a continuous variable that's built into general relativity, it's built into classical physics, uh, but time is in fact discrete. It's, it's discrete in, in units of the, of the Planck time. We just don't notice that because Planck time is so small by our everyday standards. And theories uh, that assume that time is continuous often run into quantum uh, electrodynamics was a good example of this, where they assumed time was a continuous variable and ran into these infinities that they had to go into a lot of trouble to get rid of, but they, they wouldn't have been there if they had accepted the fact that time was discrete. Let me just jump in. Before I invite the folks to the uh, microphones, I want to ask each of you to respond to a last question. As we try to summarize and really bring this debate to a head, which aspect of the other person's position do you think is the weakest and most in need of criticism, or which of your own arguments do you think is the, is the strongest? By the way, as you come to the microphones, could we make the request that those who've already asked a question hold themselves back, and we let people who haven't been to the mic today have the first chance to raise a question could, at the two could mics? Could we also split them up and have questions for me over here? Uh, no, I'll, I'll just, if it gets to one side, we'll fix it, but that's a little bit too formal. I just want to ask people who haven't had a chance to talk yet to make sure they do. Um, why don't we let you guys each make a, a, a last comment. So what's the strongest argument either on behalf of your case or the weakest of Vicks? And I'll ask him the same question. Well, So you can really focus us in on what you think is the strongest part of the case. Well, let me make a general statement about Excellent. the day that I think also applies here is that, you know, as a Christian, I don't dispute the fact that physicists and mathematicians can develop mathematically consistent models that are different from what I presented here. Uh, the question is, does that pertain to physical reality? I mean, and the fact that you can design other models simply proves my point that uh, Christianity is not a one creation model. It's a multiple creation models. So we would expect that physicists would be able to develop uh, these alternate models. Uh, but what I find interesting is none of these alternate models uh, really are able to say, well, what different kind of life can you have that these laws of physics would have, or would there be fine-tuning there for that life form? And I appreciate that Victor was actually uh, making that statement in print in his paper. So in that sense, I think uh, there is a sense of agreement here. As to where my strongest point would be, what I tried to emphasize in my talk is consistency. As you go across all the sciences, as you go across all 66 books of the Bible, we see this consistent pattern of the truth being revealed. And that's really the heart of the Reformation, that God has given us two books, the book of nature, the book of scripture, and they're compatible, uh, they're consistent. And this is what I tried to demonstrate in the limited time that I had. Thanks, and what would be the most important point you'd want to re remind us of? Well, the, the, uh, the God of the gaps argument has always been used uh, uh, to provide a place for God. The idea is that if uh, science can't explain something, then maybe we need to reintroduce God. That's been historically the reason why people even talked about God. God was always an explanation for the things they didn't understand. Now, I don't claim that we understand everything, but we can 
we can give a plausible explanation for every question of this sort. Rather than the gaps increasing, as he was, was urging, I, I claim that the gaps have pretty much disappeared. Not that, again, we can explain everything, but we have a plausible explanation. And that's why I wanted to give some detail into that, that scenario for the natural origin of the universe. Also give you some reason, uh, idea of, of how, how uh, the laws of nature could, could come about. So I think that uh, the, the fact that uh, God is not needed, we have, an, we have a natural explanation for the universe, for everything that we know, we, in, in no place do we have to put, put God into the picture. Uh, so there's absolutely no reason to even introduce the concept of God. It's a meaningless concept. There's no, it has not only no evidence, there's no basis for it. And the universe looks just like it should look if there is no God. Thanks very much. All right, we have 17 people at the mics. The odds of that, by the way, are 10 to the minus 158. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask you to, to keep yourselves brief, please, so that we can have the, the most people to the mic as possible. Thanks. Uh, it's questions for Dr. Ross. Uh, the other speakers have spoke something about the, <clears throat> a good bit about the origin of the universe. Uh, you mentioned it only briefly. I wonder if you could tell us a little more about the origin, or your feelings about the origin. Can, can you say that again? I'm sorry, we, I, I can't hear you, a word you said. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little more about the origin of the universe. You only spoke briefly about it. Uh, the origin of the universe? Yes. Uh, your Christian your feelings of how it... The main points, just to summarize from the talk. Yeah, I, I think I did try to cover briefly what I meant by the origin of the universe. Uh, was there something more specific you wanted me to draw? Well, just mainly about how, how you feel it really started. Uh, I think he wants a thesis statement. He and wants a thesis through. statement, okay. Uh, <clears throat> no, my position is that uh, there really is a traceable uh, beginning of the Big Bang, the beginning of space-time, matter, and energy, and that there is an agent. Uh, I would call him God, the God of the Bible, and this is what the Bible teaches, that there's a supernatural agent that's beyond the universe, that creates this universe, and it's a supernatural agent that's both transcendent and imminent. I noticed that discussion came up this afternoon. You know, if God is transcendent, how can he be involved in our lives? Uh, but the biblical position is a God that is everywhere. You know, Jeremiah makes a statement uh, that wherever you go in the universe, God is there. He fills the entirety of his creation, but at the same time, he's transcendent. And God is not limited by the laws of physics or the space-time dimensions of the universe. And therefore, what would be impossible for us it could be completely possible for him. You know, we've dis discussed this in a number of our books at Reasons to Believe, and if you allow God to be bigger than the universe, then all these so-called paradoxical doctrines make perfect sense. Does that help you? I don't know why that's on yes, target. Thank you. Great, let's move to the next question, please. <clears throat> Someone said that uh, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian would disprove the theory of evolution. I'd like each of the speakers to say what would be a, a Precambrian rabbit for your theory. What would be a Precambrian what? A Precambrian rabbit. A Precambrian rabbit. Well, yeah, I think I understand the question. And uh, you know, what we heard this morning was this discussion how the Cambrian explosion wasn't really an explosion, took place over a large period of time. I don't think you understood. Uh, someone said, what would make you doubt the theory of evolution? And he said, if we found Precambrian, uh, Precambrian rabbit fossils, that well, would that disprove wouldn't be it. a would problem any, for me. Would anything disprove, I'm asking you, what would, what would yeah. disprove your theory? Yeah, so the question is, uh, a decisive falsification, a Precambrian rabbit would falsify standard theories of evolution, what would be the decisive falsification of your position? I think that was the question. Well, a decisive falsification would be if we were to prove that human beings were nothing more than physical animals. I mean, the heart of the Christian faith is that God created three different kinds of animal life. Animal life is purely physical. Animal life is nefesh, which means mind, body, and pardon me, mind, will, and emotion, so that they can nurture different members of their species and form relationships with us human beings, serve and please us, basically a reference to the birds and mammals, and that human beings are body, soul, and spirit. So if scientists were to prove that humanity had no spirit dimension, they were pretty physical, that would be the end of the Christian faith. Hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Ross, you, you, know, you referenced a whole lot of quotes in the Bible, which have 
of course, I'll have, I would love to have the PowerPoint slides to actually look at and go look at them. But oh, sure. I'm going to give it's you the benefit. It's up on our website. I'm sure it is. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say that God created the universe and wrote this book. And as you seem to indicate, he left a lot of evidence to state, you know, things that we wouldn't know until much later. Cosmology that you're saying that the creation story, for example, is verified by modern cosmology. Can you cite a single equation or maybe pi calculated out to a reasonable decimal point that would indicate that we we're talking about someone really smart <laughs> that, that really could write something concrete like that? Okay, well, and why only in the Christian Bible? Not, why not in Islamic texts? Okay, yeah, you're going to have to state that question because you're asking me for an equation that proves that God is smart. I'm asking you if God wrote any numbers anywhere, any equations, could he have maybe written E equals MC squared somewhere to demonstrate that he really did do all this stuff? Okay, okay yeah. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory There's of God. There's an equation in Psalm 19? Okay. Right, okay. yeah. His words are written upon the heavens for all of us to read that if we're willing to look it says, the earth declares the glory of God. Yeah, the earth is filled of his uh, creation miracles. If we're willing to look, we'll find them. Romans 1 also makes the point, though, that we human beings have this tendency to worship the creation rather than the creator. And I see that amongst my fellow scientists. We're so fascinated by what we see in creation that we don't see what lies behind that. But from a biblical perspective, if you open up your eyes, you will see the handiwork of God. The heavens are not empty of uh, testifying of his creation. From a Christian perspective, God has given us a second book, Can the I book of nature. Yes. Let me let uh, Vic respond and then we'll move to the next question. Yeah, I mean, I think as a physicist, what you, you would have to do is, is say, uh, uh, let's make a hypothesis and, and what observation are you making that, uh, that would verify or falsify that hypothesis? And of course, design arguments are the, the, the most common arguments that most Christians make, or most believers make of all sorts. Why do you believe? How could all this have happened uh, by, you know, by a natural means? And of course, that's what the whole debate with evolution and intelligent design is, is all about. And incidentally, the intelligent design people did understand that concept that I was making earlier, that to uh, refute the God of the gaps argument, you, you don't have to uh, prove, give a scientific explanation for, for your gap, you just have to give a plausible one. They understood that because their burden, uh, they understood, was to not only uh, show that there was no, phys no physical explanation, no natural explanation for some, for some gap in scientific knowledge, but that no one was possible. And intelligent design people were trying to do that with and with uh, irreducible complexity and so on, to come up with some way to show that uh, that gap is going to always exist, that science would never be able to fill that gap. And that's why they, they failed so abysmally, because there were good explanations, plausible explanations for every example they gave. So you have to, you have to uh, give a reason, you know, some, some observation that, that uh, Right. distinguishes between mm -hmm. the two, not just one that's consistent with your own particular likings. Yes, I, I've been raised as a Christian, and I like the idea that there's a God out there. Uh, you have to find something more than that. Well, I would argue that's a bad way to use gaps to test different models. As I mentioned, there's always gaps in every explanation because we don't know everything. The real test is, are the gaps getting bigger or smaller in the context of your model? and they're getting progressively smaller and smaller, then that means your model is probably on target. But the gaps are getting progressively bigger yeah, and bigger. The like whole history are. of science is the gaps getting smaller That's and smaller. That's not true. Yeah. Origin of life is a prime example where the gaps are getting dramatically bigger from a naturalistic perspective. I think we have a disagreement here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take the next question. Yes, uh, this question is for Dr. Ross. From what I hear is that you're quoting the Bible to uh, explain science and all that, but it seems like you think that all the other biblical scholars and other Christians have gotten it wrong and you have gotten it correct in your interpretation. So can you tell me, are there any other biblical scholars or any other churches that endorse your particular interpretation of the Bible? Yeah, my interpretation is by no means unique. 
Uh, you can go to our website and see a list of uh, world-renowned theologians that endorse our position. Uh, there are literally dozens of them. So I'm not, we're not trying to promote uh, an obscurant view of the interpretation of the Bible. It's solidly Reformation in its perspective. So uh, we're really saying nothing different than what you see in the, the Belgic Confession and the Westminster Confession. Uh, but we do see differences amongst Christian apologists on the Christian faith. And uh, young earth creationists, for example, accuse me of outright heresy. Uh, so, I mean, there is debate going on amongst different Christian perspectives. Are we talking theistic evolution? Are we talking young earth creationism? Are we talking the gap theory? Are we talking the framework hypothesis uh, or the model that we offer of uh, concordism and um, uh, integration? You know, which of these is right? So just like we want to put to the test non-Christian models with respect to our model, we're arguing that the Christian community needs to set an example for the scientific community in vigorously and rigorously testing their different interpretations of uh, scripture, theology, and creation. And the more that that happens, the better. Next question, please. <clears throat> Forgive me if this is common knowledge, but my curiosity is just eating me on this. Dr. Ross, did you consult in any way or were you consulted on the production of Ben Stein's recent movie? Uh, no, not at all. In fact, uh, you can go to our website and see that uh, we have a statement about what we think about Ben Stein's movie. We were one of the few Christian organizations that did not endorse it. In fact, we see it as a gross misrepresentation of what's going on in academia. I mean, our scientists speak on university campuses all over America and around the world. Uh, we have hundreds of PhD level scientists that volunteer for us, and uh, they're not seeing that kind of persecution. Now, I think if you're a young earth in your perspective, yeah, you can expect that kind of uh, persecution to take place. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Ross, you said that you had a testable and falsifiable uh, set of evidence for a creator of the universe, yet it seemed like all you did was provide a, a, a huge number of how unlikely it was that we would have conditions that were conducive to human life and that by virtue of the fact that we are here against such odds that you your claim was not falsified it was in fact reinforced um, that just seems like a, a very weak sort of argument to me that it's really unlikely that we're here uh, was there anything that I missed in that was there more depth to this verifiable and falsifiable method that you had sure you know keep in mind I was limited to just 25 minutes uh, what we're doing at Reasons to Believe is developing a set of uh, tests. Uh, we can actually classify them to three categories. Uh, things that would actually falsify our model to such a degree, the model would be done. Uh, for example, if we were to prove scientifically there's no beginning to the universe, or there's nothing special about humanity with respect to, say, uh, clams and oysters and bacteria, that would be catastrophic to the Christian model that we're presenting. There are other things that would be simply corrosive uh, to our model. It wouldn't destroy our model, but would require major adjustments to our model. And then there are discoveries that would simply refine our model. And what we're trying to do at Reasons to Believe is to develop these three different kinds of uh, discoveries that would be you know, catastrophic, corrosive, or refining, not just for our model, but different models within the Christian realm, and then models outside the Christian realm, covering the whole creation evolution spectrum. That's really the way to put these different things to the test. And I would say it's incumbent upon every model developer to come up with a list of things that would confirm, and that's kind of what I focused on today, confirmations. I didn't have time to get into things that would not confirm the model, things that would be corrosive, uh, you know, catastrophic, or simply uh, fine-tuning adjustments uh, to the model. And if you want to see how things have developed, I mean, I've been working on this since 1973. I've come up with five editions, for example, of uh, Genesis 1 as scientific interpretation. And you can actually see the evolution of the interpretation uh, of our uh, message concerning Genesis 1 over the course of those 35 years. Uh, but what you see is that the refinements, we're not seeing anything happening in science that is corrosive or destructive, which means maybe our interpretation really has validity. All right, what we're gonna do now then is to move to the closing part of today's meeting. Those who are in line can stay, but we'd like to broaden discussion back to the entire day.
I don't think that there are speakers here from this morning, but you're welcome up as well. And I'd like the three speakers from this afternoon, please, to come and uh, join me in front. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, you today have had it all from the beginning of the universe through the formation of life, growth of complexity, consciousness, uh, the big questions raised by science, and finally, the God debate itself. And we now take, rather than us making lengthy closing statements, we turn it to your critical minds to probe, push, and question. The one thing I'll probably do, though, if every question is, is uh, directed at Dr. Hugh Ross, I may suggest a moratorium of, um, of the Hugh Ross persecution, and, um, I mean questions, and, uh, and broaden it out. Uh, so I saw a hand here, which I presume means it's a different kind of question. All right, um, before the moratorium, one more okay. Ross question. <laughs> the, um, as opposed to the two speakers this afternoon, uh, pro-religious speakers, you, you gave a lot of, uh, of information that is actually derivable from science. As Dr. Stenger uh, uh, pointed out, those probabilities that you indicate for the evolution of life and human life, uh, frankly, are incredible. Uh, I wonder if you have any, uh, uh, or if anybody uh, here there has, uh, on the panel has any other uh, numbers that would be, to my mind, more credible than that. Well, what I have done with those numbers is actually give them to other astronomers uh, and just say, you know, could you just, independent of me, kind of go through uh, the literature I've accumulated and uh, just see what kind of numbers you come up with. And to be frank, the numbers vary quite a bit. Uh, but it doesn't really change the argument. We may differ by you know, 10 or 20 zeros, but that's not going to you know, change the point by much. Okay, let's see if anyone else has some different numbers. Well, I see a number. Can I make back. a comment about probabilities? <coughs> uh, you'll see these probability calculations done in, in uh, all these papers on fine-tuning tune fine -tuning, uh, arguments and so on, uh, and they, they look uh, pretty small. And so then the person says, well, how could it uh, have happened naturally? Well, you know, a lot of things in this uh, world happen uh, naturally that have very low probability. If you just consider the probability that Dr. Ross exists, what was the chances of his, his parents meeting? Remember that particular sperm meeting up at that particular egg? <laughs> Multiply that by his parents meeting and his grandparents and go back, all the way back to the, the bacteria of, the, of billions of years ago that uh, had some, had some uh, effect on uh, his, his eventual development. That probability would be far lower than anything you could calculate uh, for, uh, uh, and, uh, and that's the point. The only way you can compare probabilities is by, by talk about probabilities, is by comparing them. If you say this is a probability 10 to the minus 7,623 that the thing is natural, okay, compare it with the probability that it's supernatural. You've got to calculate that somehow. I don't know how you calculate it, but it could be 10 to the minus a billion. Mm -hmm. So uh, without comparing probabilities, they're meaningless. All right, is this a non-Hugh Ross question? Just a general, general question. Great, thank you. Uh, it, would, it has to do with like whether or not there's a beginning to the universe, and I would just like to know, when you add in the multiverse, the four different multiverse views, and uh, how does that relate to whether there is a singular beginning, and how does that relate? Is there any evidence from the W map that would point in one way or another? Anyway, Sean. If I had a mic, I could answer. Uh, we're going to pass them back and forth. I think it's the only way to handle it, okay. I think. Don't hold it too close. Yeah. OK, so the question is, is there, um, there were a couple of questions in there. Is it possible that the multiverse has something to do with the singularity that is predicted by classical general relativity? And is there any possible evidence for or against from, for example, observations of the cosmic background radiation? So the, Honest answer to the first one is we don't know, of course. We need a quantum theory of gravity to describe what happens in the early universe, and we don't have one yet. It is very possible that a quantum theory of gravity, either string theory or something else, will help us understand how a universe like ours could have arisen either out of nothing or out of a pre-existing universe. So that's very possible, but right now we're in the we don't know stage. Uh, for the second question, but what about evidence? This is uh, an active area of current research interest. There are 
things in the microwave background radiation, for the most part, it looks really plain. It looks really vanilla and uninteresting, which is a terrible thing as a cosmologist. There's not that much information you can squeeze out of it. It tells us what the current constituents are of the universe, the baryons, the dark matter, the dark energy. But it doesn't, other than that, there's not a lot of information. But there are anomalies in the cosmic microwave background. There are small features that maybe if you squint at them in just the right way, they're a little bit unlikely. And so you have to ask yourself, is it because of some influence? Is it because we're not seeing a pristine bubble nucleation, but something that was influenced by what happened before a period of inflation in the early universe or something like that? And again, right now, we simply don't know. But we are working on this. We're trying to get there. There's a lot of data, and we're trying to analyze it. And I think it's completely plausible to imagine that once we understand perfectly well the microwave background we see, we will understand better not just inflationary cosmology or the Big Bang, but maybe even some influences that came from what came before. Thanks. Sir. Like, for example, uh, there's hope that if we get better measurements of the cosmic background radiation, we'll not only be able to demonstrate that we live in an inflationary universe, but what kind of inflationary universe. If we can detect gravity waves, that'll help us constrain our models a little more. And I think realistically, within five or 10 years, we could be there and be able to answer these questions more definitively than we can today, and actually put to the test uh, some of these speculations that we've been hearing about. Thanks. Next question, please. Yeah, this is for, for all the believers, and I thank you for being willing to step into this coliseum. <laughs> well, fu fu fundamental question here. Why does God, who's omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, whatever, why does God need us, and why did he take 14 billion years to create this home? Well, that's a good question. Let me see. I think I lost my microphone. Here we go. Um, as we heard this morning, uh, the age of the universe really is a critical factor for whether or not you get humans given the laws of physics. In fact, there's really no way you can bring advanced life upon the cosmic scene in anything less than about 14 billion years. And it's just because of the way the physics is structured. You say, well, why does God need us anyway? Uh, well, there are hints of that in terms of uh, what the Bible teaches, that uh, God has a higher purpose for creating this universe than merely to provide us with a home. That his ultimate purpose is to bring about the end of all evil and suffering. And evidently, this is the perfect universe to bring about that end quickly and efficiently. And once that end takes place, he'll replace his universe with a different universe, different dimensionality, a different physics. This is what separates Christian theology from, say, the other religions. Hugh, you let me let uh, either Ken or Nancy jump in, if you wish. Uh, I would not see that as God's purpose at all, because I don't think there was any evil before we came along. Uh, uh. <laughs> uh, God does not need us, but God wants us, because God is uh, described first and ultimately as a God of love, and God wanted an object of love. And so the reason the human species, among all of the others, is um, designated by God as special is because we alone have the capacity to know that we are loved by God and to love God freely in return. And I'll answer the, I'll answer the 14 billion year part, which is for an eternal being, the, the length of time has absolutely no significance. If God always was and always will be, What's 14,000, 14 million, or 14 billion? Hmm. Thanks. Can I, can I, um, uh, well, let me, can I, can you work it into the next question that'll come your way? To, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's how we all do it anyway. <laughs> this is questions about origins of life, so I don't know how you're going to do that. But uh, just curiously, you had mentioned that, that that gap was getting larger. This morning we heard a speaker give uh, quite a few possible and plausible explanations for the origins of, of life, yet I've heard Dr. Shapiro say the RNA world theory, theory synthesis theory is uh, he would, he'll stick with science, you can believe it if you want. So my question is, where are we at with origins of life theories? Dr. Ross, you've written a book on that. Uh, Dr. Miller, you, you may have some opinions about that. W how are we coming along in that research? Do we really have an answer? Miller seemed to say his experiments weren't getting us any closer. It's been 50 years since he did his. Where are we really at with that? Yeah, I made the statement twice today that uh, you know, the gap is much bigger from a naturalistic perspective today than it was in the days of the Miller-Urey experiment. Uh, we now know today that the Miller experiment is irrelevant to the origin of life. Those are not the conditions under which uh, life originated here on the Earth. And you know, my colleague, Fazal Rana, our staff biochemist, 
We've been attending origin of life research conferences that are held every three years. And what you notice there is they recognize that the situation is getting worse and worse from a naturalistic perspective. Uh, we don't find any prebiotics on the earth. If the prebiotics were there, we'd see the signature. The signature is not there. Uh, there's no solution to the homochirality problem on the earth. Neither is there in outer space. If life came from outer space, the prebiotics came from outer space, where are the sugars? Uh, where are the amino acids? Uh, where are the nucleotides? We see them in meteorites, but we're not seeing them in the, these it, gas clouds where we should expect to see them. It would be interesting to have Ken Miller, who also sure. bears the label sure. believer, to respond to the same question. Yeah, I, I, the, the, the notion that there's an increasing gap in, uh, in naturalistic attempts to explain the origin of life um, strikes me as very strange and very unusual. Um, the reason for that is origin of life research is a very vigorous field. Um, it's true it's an unsolved scientific problem. That's what makes it an interesting scientific problem. It's also, uh, I think, a bit misleading to say that Stanley Miller's experiment um, tells us nothing because we know that the atmospheric conditions were wrong. Stanley Miller spent the rest of his life, which ended only last year, redoing that experiment. Now, why did he keep redoing it? The answer is he wanted to be responsive to the best that atmospheric scientists were telling him about the composition of the Earth's early atmosphere. So every time there was different evidence or different ideas, he repeated the experiment. And guess what? You keep producing the basic building blocks of life. And the notion that simple compounds, amino acids, certain nucleotides, and so forth, cannot be formed by, uh, by pre-biologic processes turns out to be absolutely bogus. And one of the best examples of that is when meteorites fall to Earth, they've got amino acids on them. So that tells us that there are natural processes that are occurring now or have occurred in the recent past in outer space that produce that. So the prediction of the production of these building blocks is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to pretend for a second that there's an easy step-by-step -step pathway by which you go from these building blocks to a self-replicating process or a living cell. But I certainly would advise any fellow Christian not to stake their faith <laughs> on the idea that this is a problem that science will never solve. We have a way of solving these problems. Good. Can I also comment, because I disagree. Uh, I agree 100% with what, with what uh, Ken just said. I mean, the point of the Miller experiment was it showed a, a very important principle that people don't seem to grasp. And that is, in this, in this physical world, there's, there's a natural tendency of simple systems to produce more complex systems. Mm -hmm. You can see that in chemistry. You can see that in physics. You can see that in computer simulations of all sorts of systems, that, that the tendency is really an amazing tendency for simplicity to uh, generate complexity. And uh, maybe Phil would want to comment about that. There's an expert on, uh, on emergence. Isn't that exactly what's happening with emergence? There you go, boy. I'm so glad I got a plug out of that one. <laughs> Next question. Well, we would welcome a debate in the origin of light. So you know, pick your person. We'd be happy to do it. If there is this God that has fine-tuned the universe for human life, why would he create the Earth with limited resources? Who says the resources are limited? <laughs> to give the Republicans something to do. I got squeeze, but I want to say into that. That was a good lead in. I was waiting for that. Segue. As a working cosmologist, uh, I just wanted to comment on all the fine-tuning arguments that, we, that we've heard. Uh, namely, that in, in my personal opinion, they're all completely fantastical. Uh, we have no idea what laws of physics and what parameters of nature are required to create and allow for the existence of intelligent life. We have no idea whether in our current universe life could exist on the surface of a neutron star or in the dark matter or it, uh, several trillion trillion years from now in some other completely different form. And the proof for that is that if I handed anyone in this room or outside this room the standard model of particle physics, the theory that we now believe, believe you know, explains the uh, motion of atoms and molecules of, of which life is made and said, tell me the values of the parameters for which a complex life form is possible without knowing the actual answers, no one would be able to figure it out. It's just completely implausible. We know that our parameters work, but we don't know, and we should not go around saying that other parameters would not work just as well.
I think we owe the woman um, a response to the question, Nancy or Ken. Why would God was it uh, would put oh, well, us on a planet well, with you, limited you, you, resources? I think you answer the question by going to the negative, which is saying, what would a planet look like with unlimited resources? And the answer is it would be a, viola be a violation of everything we understand by physics and chemistry. And maybe it was to teach us a lesson um, about living within our means. <laughs> and, and even if it's not the case that we can show that no other universe could support life, we do know that, that our universe supports life, and we know what was necessary for us in order to be here. And the more we know about the constraints on the various constants that go into our basic physics, the more we see that the uh, planet we live on had to be pretty much the way it is. So for instance, one of the big questions about uh, evil uh, is um, earthquakes, tsunamis. If we don't live on, an, on one of their very few planets with um, moving crusts, uh, we simply would not have the rich um, elemental resources that we need at this point for uh, complex life. And also, we wouldn't have the geography that makes our water systems work. On the other hand, we shouldn't be surprised that a whole different set of fine-tuning characteristics might operate for angels as opposed to us human beings. But if oh, God, if, if, if there were any, if, if God <laughs> was so great and he really wanted humans to be an important part of his plan, he could have had us live in outer space. He could have had us uh, uh, do anything. I mean, he was God after all. But instead, he, he, he builds this universe where we're in this tiny little spot uh, that, and, and where. I mean, I've looked a lot into the question of, of extraterrestrial life, and I'll tell you, there's no way that humanity will ever bodily move to another planet and find another planet that it can live on the way they do in Star Trek. We're stuck to this planet. Maybe our robots will go, our computers will go, but we're stuck. And, and uh, to say that the universe is really fine-tuned for us, and that's, that's ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Vic. All right, we're down to our last few minutes. I want to get as many of the questioners to get their questions on the table as possible, and then I'm going to ask the people for a one-sentence closing statement, which I'll describe in a minute. Oh, Just no. a, a quick comment. Uh, the logical fallacy of after-the-fact reasoning is not the purview of Christianity uh, alone. Uh, in Islam, actually, there is a full industry of finding science in the Quran, and it's equally fallacious. But uh, especially in the 70s, actually, one of the biggest sellers was the Bible, Quran, and science. And Morris Bukhale found that Bible doesn't have anything good on science, but Quran finds it. And he also has the same things about expansion of the universe. Uh, but I would actually like to ask Michael, because this is one of the things that goes into the balloony detection kit, about uh, analyzing uh, some of the claims the way uh, Dr. Ross presented it, for example, after the facts of how he was using those. Yeah. No. Oh. That's right. Okay. All right. Yeah. The bonding detection, people read back into what they, what they already believe. Microphone. And then, yeah, the microphone, right. Anyway, he had it right. Well, could I respond to their <laughs> comment um, about actually, the, actually, Hugh, let me ask you to hold and sure. get as many of these folks on the table as Sorry. possible, please. Uh, yes, this is a question on fine tuning. We've heard from various speakers that if you twiddle this constant a little bit, everything doesn't work, twiddle that one, it doesn't work. The probability of getting all this stuff done right is 10 to the minus 100, 200, 500, 1,000. Uh, yeah, we've also heard that, uh, that this fine tuning is not much of a big deal, and it's not really that fine tuned. Is there a scientifically uh, accurate way that you can settle this kind of vast difference in the question of fine tuning? Yes. <laughs> yes, if you could actually tell me what the universe were to look like had the parameters of nature been different. So again, my point is that if I told you the mass of the up quark and the down quark and the electron, but you didn't know there was such a thing as a carbon atom, you wouldn't say that that choice of parameters permitted life. So in order to answer your question, you'd have to scan over all the possible choices of the values of those parameters and say, for these choices, complex, uh, conscious, metabolizing organisms are possible, and for these ones it's not. And that's a very scientific question. Let me, let, let, let me jump in on this, Ed, with great fear, because I'm not a physicist. Um, on, the, on, on, the issue, on the issue of fine tuning, one of the things that we often think about, we think about, can the constants vary and could you still get life? 
is we look at life as we have it right now, and this is one of the reasons why would you get significant amounts of carbon produced in solar furnaces is an extremely important question. And when you see if you vary some of the constants, you're not going to get that carbon produced, we conclude that's, that's not going to happen. Well, I honestly, I honestly take issue with some of the things that Sean just said, because he's basically holding open the idea that we don't know about other possibilities, other possible life forms. And he's right about that. But on the other hand, um, the only example that we have of life is indeed tightly dependent upon the balance in these fundamental constants. And Martin Rees's book pointed that out very well. I'm going to risk uh, uh, one brief thing. You're cheating. Uh, you have an I, iPhone. I am cheating because I wanted to look something up. And here's what it was. I grabbed, <laughs> I grabbed, I, uh, and by the way, Milwaukee is leading. Um, <laughs> I grabbed one of the Bible verses off the slide that Dr. Ross showed, because I wanted to find mm. a Bible verse that says the universe is expanded. And one of them was the 104th Psalm, which I've heard before, and I'm thinking, I didn't see cosmic expansion in the 104th Psalm. Here's, what, here's how the first two verses read, the ones he cited. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain. I see in that a description of what the heavens look like stretched from horizon to horizon. I don't see cosmic expansion there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, if you, if you, I'm tempted to let the last two people speak. I think hunger is beating thought uh, or about to take over like Milwaukee. So uh, maybe we can do the last two and then our closing sentences. Can we do that? I was. Uh, second to last question, please. Yeah. Uh, I would like both Dr. Miller and Dr. Ross and Dr. Murphy to answer the following from their own personal perspectives. My mother was an Auschwitz survivor, and in her later life in the United States, a number of Christians tried to witness to her, and she rejected their overtures and finished her life as what she called herself an agnostic Jew. Would each of the three of you tell me whether, in your view, my mother will be denied ultimate admission into heaven? Ab absolutely not. Um, there you go. Uh, uh, people who are seeking the truth with all their hearts, who turn away from God because they can't reconcile the God that we've been taught to believe in with the amount of evil that they see in the world, uh, those people are a lot closer to God's heart than the folks who are just blithely playing golf on Sunday mornings and not thinking about it. Okay. With, well, with the other two? <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been a pastor or... for 34 years and have seen a lot of people on their deathbeds. And it's amazing when they're at the point of death how, how focused their dealings with spiritual issues become. And so, in terms of your mother, I don't know what happened in the last few minutes of her life or the last few hours of her life. I don't think you do either. Uh, but I've had enough experience to recognize that more can happen in those last few minutes than can happen in an entire lifetime. And so who am I to judge exactly what kind of communication was going on between your mother okay. and God? Well, the, question, the answer, answer to the question is this. If she died uh, not accepting Jesus. If she died not accepting Jesus, then yes, my position is that uh, she would not go to the new creation. But whether or not that was really the case, I'm not in a position to say. Okay. My, my, my position is that I would not put myself as a judge over anyone, and I believe that the kingdom of heaven belongs to the pure of spirit, and it certainly sounds like that applied to your mother. All right. And I'd like to ask the last, you two both have a chance. This woman has stood up three or four times in a row and been <laughs> cut off every time. It seems so unjust and unfair. <laughs> so, so do, well, I, you know, at some point we've got to be unjust. There, look it at, depends. there, he do let we still have a moratorium on <laughs> Final question of the day. I said it depends. Do we still have a moratorium on Dr. Ross? Because no. it is contingent upon <laughs> Dr. Ross. Go ahead. Any question. You get, you get your question. Dr. Ross, your argument lies primarily in the uh, strong anthropic principle. That basically the universe is fine-tuned for mankind, and then it was done so in advance by an all-powerful deity. My question for you, you, you raise, I believe you call it cosmic design features. And you said that with each cosmic design feature, it leads us to basically prove more and more with each discovery the existence of God. But then you, you also, on the 
kind of like in the same breath, talk about the Garden of Eden and creation. And what I want to know, my question to you is, how do you rationalize pairing the Garden of Eden, Eden and creation story with evolution and the 4.6 uh, I'm sorry, billion year history of the universe? How do you even attempt to converge those two because they're diametrically opposed? Uh, not at all. I mean, I didn't even know there was such a position as young earth creationism until I'd been a Christian for eight years. It never occurred to me anyone who ever would read the Bible and draw a young earth interpretation out of it. And this is because, you know, with my Gideon Bible, without any other, even knowing other Christians, going through Genesis 1, there is an evening and a morning for the first six days. There is no evening and morning for day seven. Day seven is the day of rest, where God rests from his work of creation. John 5, Jesus talks about how he and his Father are resting from that work of creation, present tense. We're still in the seventh day. God doesn't create again until we reach the new creation. Do you the believe seventh in day is a long period of time. Answer me. I'm, 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 I know it's, this is one question, but this hinges on this. Do you believe in evolution? If you don't, then I understand why you can't answer this question. No, no. But if you do believe in evolution, you can't co coincide the two because man would have to evolve. And God, supposedly, and I don't believe in God, created man in his image. So what did he create him as a single cell bacteria? Is that God's image? And that he's con constantly changing his I own image over question. the evolutionary process? <laughs> I think I got your question. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are many different definitions of evolution. I believe that life has been here for 3.8 billion years. I believe that life has gone from simple to complex. Now, what I dispute are the mechanisms that bring about that change from simplicity to complexity. And you know, I believe you have to bring in all the sciences and the theology to really answer that question in depth. We've done that in a number of our books. Our position is that uh, God does intervene to specially create. He did that explicitly with the human species. We have a book you can see out there on the table called Who is Adam? <coughs> where we review what has happened in the last 10 years of anthropological and human genetics research, showing, number one, that we can't measure uh, you know, change in the human genome over the past 40,000 years, nor can we see that in Neanderthal. We've got mitochondrial DNA now from 12 different Neanderthal specimens. We compare that Neanderthal DNA with human mitochondrial DNA, we can see a distinct difference, enough that tells us that Neanderthals are not part of our ancestry. Likewise, you look at Homo erectus, they've okay. been here from 1.8 to 200,000, 1.8 million to 200,000 years. We don't see change there. We see evidence supporting the fact that uh, the descent of man hypothesis doesn't seem to be considered. I appreciate you answering. I think okay. we're going to disagree. Yeah. Thank you Thanks for, your for, answer. for that. Well, take a look at our book. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, a final sentence to leave us with. They always say, what's your take home message? So, you know, you've done these brilliant presentations and talks, and if you wanted to sum it up in a single sentence that you want us to remember your contribution with, what would you like to leave us with? How many Next. clauses may be used? Oh, you've got to be short on clauses. Uh, We're really hungry right, now. All right. Keep the clauses short. No Nancy Murphy. Nothing I know of science contradicts essentials of Christianity, and some discussions provide mild confirmation, but uh, almost all Christians in the West gave up natural theology a long time ago, which is the attempt to get theological conclusions primarily from the order of nature, and so I'm not at all unhappy that none of you scientists find science to be supportive of Christianity. Okay. <laughs> you, Russ. I do find it to be supportive, but my sentence is this. Words of the Apostle Paul, everything must be tested. Hold fast to that which is good. All right. Sean Carroll. The world is not magic. <laughs> Ken, Ken Miller. I'm going to paraphrase somebody else. There are two ways to look at things. The way is, one way is to look at the world as though nothing is a miracle, and the other way is to look at it as though everything is a miracle. I choose the latter. Huh? Vic Stinger. We are all frozen nothing.
And on that note, my sentence is, be skeptical. <laughs> Please join me in thanking the speakers.